truly tithe is the title of our exhortation taken from Deuteronomy chapter 14 and verses 22 to 29. <coughs> All the increase in the fear of the Lord, verse 22 to 23. The assembling of yourselves, verse 24 to 26. And the given and the blessing, verse 27 to 29. The Beatitudes teach us the heart of the way we are to live. We were mentioning about the Beatitudes on Reformation Sunday. Like the Old Testament's Ten Commandments, it teaches us how to live. Now, there is a key word, and that word is are. And the blessings of, multiples of blessings are pronounced of those who are like this. The world is more interested in the word have. If you have things, then you are considered blessed by the world's interpretation of that word. The world thinks happiness comes with your ability, money, your cleverness, your possessions, your good looks, your power or your fame. But we know people who have a lot and they are perfectly miserable. Happiness does not come from what a man has, but what a man is. And this was what Jesus was conveying to us when he uh, came upon earth to show us the way of true happiness, the way of true blessedness. And so there is a need for us to renew in our mind, isn't it, when we come to the Lord, because the ways of true blessing and happiness is very different from what we understand to be those things that the world would offer us and the philosophy of this world has bombarded us and life has taught us how important it is that to unlearn. So there are those who would not go to church because they would not want to give. They would not want to tithe. And this is contrary to the teaching of God's word. We have here a part of the statutes concerning tithes, Matthew Henry tells us. The productions of the ground were twice tithed, so that putting both together a fifth part was devoted to God out of their increase, 20%. And only four parts of five were for their own common use. Is it a lot? It's a lot, isn't it? Thinking... ...are given 100% uh, to, to keep for ourselves 80% and to remember the Lord with 20% of what God has given to us indeed as we make our calculation ah, you realize uh, it's not exacting uh, but it's by way in which we would not forget the eighth part of our blessings and so they could not but own, they pay an easy rent, especially since God's part was disposed of to their own benefit and advantage. The first tithe was for the maintenance of their Levites, who taught them the good knowledge of God and ministered to them in holy things. This is supposedly as anciently due as is entailed upon the Levites as an inheritance by that law. New Numbers 18 verse 24. God's provision for Aaron and his family will be the tithes and offerings of the people. The Levites have no land. The Levites were entrusted with stewarding the things of God to the whole nation. As the people would come and give their produce, they will be 
for the priest's sustenance. There, the priest will not have land. In other words, they will have no means or no other means of sustenance. God made provision so that the people may, through the work of the priesthood, come nigh in the worship of God and to bringing their various offerings for trespasses and thanksgiving. A tenth part in Israel will be the inheritance of the Levites. Numbers 18, verse 21 and 24. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance, for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. But the tithe of the children of Israel, which they offer as an heave offering unto the Lord, I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore I have said unto them, Among the children of Israel, they have no inheritance. The Levites in turn are to offer a tenth of all that were received in thanksgiving to the Lord. When the Levites had thus paid the tenth of their income as a heave offering to the Lord, they had themselves the comfortable enjoyment of the other nine parts. When you have thus heaved the best from it, for still God's part must be the best, then ye shall eat the rest, not as a holy thing, but as with the same freedom that the other Israelites eat their part with in every place you and your households. Numbers 18 verse 31. But it is the second tithe that is here spoken in Deuteronomy 14, verses 22 to 29. Not the normal tithing that we are speaking about that is emphasized here. As a reminder, uh, Spans observed, the tithe of verse 22 to 29 is peculiar to Deuteronomy and therefore should be understood as a supplementary law. Since the land was given by promise and grace, it belonged to the Lord. So, we are, we are studying Israel going to inherit the land, isn't it? That they were slaves in Egypt and God freed them from their slavery and brought them to a land uh, of promise uh, filled with uh, flowing, overflowing with milk and honey. And so, the land was given by promise and grace. It belonged to the Lord. And as it is often a pattern in Deuteronomy, the tithe signified that Israel had received the land from the Lord. And therefore, God's ownership should be acknowledged. So we often think that what is ours is ours. Right? Uh, uh, what is the Lord's is the Lord's. But here, the Lord is saying to us, all is the Lord's, isn't it? In the sense that He has given us all things. Even the life that, that we have comes from Him. Right? Without Him giving us the life, we have no life at all. How can we, without Him, properly live? Along with this thought, we can see the time of tithe at the end of every third year became a time for the Levi, the strangers, the fatherless and the widow to get to eat in delight and be satisfied in a portion. It was a gathering place for Israel in joy and thanksgiving. This Deuteron tithe is a second tithe. It's on top of the tithe that that we speak about, that they came together. Uh, and this we seek to understand and study today. The first thought, all the increase in the fear of the Lord. The general principle is given there. Thou shalt truly tithe. That's the uh, exhortation of Moses before they entered the land, before they even possessed the land. All the increase of thy seed. And here, all means all, isn't it? Uh, there's no evasion. That the field bringeth forth 
year by year. So the Lord is going to bless them with increase year by year. Right? The Lord's blessing is not just one year uh, and then it uh, stops. But year by year, Israel is promised the blessing of God, God's care upon them. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which he shall choose to place his name there. We were speaking about uh, the place of worship that the Lord would set for his people and how uh, that place was Jerusalem, isn't it? In the fullness of time, uh, that was where uh, Israel would, as it were, settle down in the land and God would instruct uh, David and Solomon to prepare and to build the temple where the people of God would gather uh, to worship Him. And thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which th He shall choose to place His name there, the tithe of thy corn and of thy wine and of thine in oil and of the firstling of thy flock, thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn the fear of the Lord always. Uh, hear the phrase there, the fear of the Lord always. What is the reason for tithing? Why do we tithe? That we may practice the fear of the Lord, to know that all that we have comes from Him. And we dare not veer away from that acknowledgement. So the fear of the Lord would grant to us a holy fear to do our duty, isn't it, before the Lord and not take for granted. Uh, Matthew Henry again said, well, they are here charged to separate it and set it apart for God. Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed. So it's very clear, isn't it? Moses taught them how they may acknowledge the Lord always. The Levites took care of their own, but the separating of this was left to the owners themselves. The law encouraging them to be honest by reposing a confidence in them. So here you see that there is no uh, there's no uh, auditing, as it were, uh, of your uh, giving. Uh, but uh, as, a, as the Lord would try His people in their hearts, through their conscience, so trying their fear of God. They are commanded to tithe truly, Matthew Henry says, that is to be sure to do it and to do it faithfully and carefully that God's part might not be diminished either with design or by oversight. So here we must be sure to give God his full dues out of our estates for being but stewards of them, it is required that we be faithful as those that must give account. And so the Lord shows us it, isn't it? and it's a, a system, as it were, uh, through teaching to help us to see and acknowledge and be blessed in life. Ah, so there is a, a good order in life, isn't it? living a life with God. The Lord showed them how they may prosper in the land in which they would inherit. Wonderful land that God would give for their possession. They are here directed how to dispose of it when they had separated it. Let every man lay by as God prospers him. So if God doesn't give, we are not expected isn't it, to, to uh, do what we do not have. 
But when the Lord gives, uh, here when the Lord uh, prospers and gives a person success, then let him lay out in pious uses as God gives him opportunity and it will be easier to lay out and the portion to be more satisfying when first, when we have first laid by. And so it's going to be a spiritual discipline, isn't it? That we will have to teach our children, that we would have to teach uh, the people of God so that they would receive the blessing of God as God has promised to accord to them. That's the uh, first thought that we have. Uh, and secondly, verse 24 to 26, the assembling of yourselves. Verse 24, And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name here, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then thou shalt turn it into money. Right? They may not be able to carry their produce uh, in kind, as it were, in their giving. And so the Lord says, uh, turn it into money. Then bind them up in thy hand and go to the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. So the Lord uh, showed them uh, how it should be done, how it can be done. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lasteth after, for oxen, or for sheep, or for wine, or for strong drink, for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and shall rejoice, and thou and thy household. So, they would come to the house of the Lord and they would assemble and feast in the house of the Lord. What a wonderful thing, isn't it? Right? For us, we do gather certain times of the, uh, of the year, uh, certain times where we would gather and we would uh, spend the time uh, in fellowship one with another. This second type may be disposed of in works of piety for the first two years after the year of release. They must bring it up either in kind or full value of it. Yeah, we're going to speak about the year of release the next time. Right? Uh, in the sense that uh, when they uh, have, for example, uh, situations where they have uh, uh, servants who come to their household to work, right? six years they would work, and on the seventh year they are to let them go. Right? The time of release, right? that, that will be the next week, right? chapter 15, we will be speaking more about it. They must bring it up either in kind or in full value of it, to the place of the sanctuary, and they must spend it by holding feast, holy feasting before the Lord, if they could do it with any convenience. They must bring it in kind, but if not, they might turn it into money, and the money must be laid out in something to feast upon before the Lord. The comfortable, cheerful, using of what God has given us. In other words, what he's saying is this, use it in the assembling of the people of God together. The assembling of the people of God together. Isn't it? You want to gather together, uh, there, there will be, uh, uh, there will be a certain cost involved and how do we ensure that we are able to to do so, well, this is what is speaking of here, a second tithe. Uh, the comfortable, cheerful using of what God has given us with temperance and sobriety is really the honouring of God with it. Contentment, holy joy and thanksgiving make every meal a religious feast. 
the end of this law we have that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. It was to keep them right and firm in the Lord. And sometimes we, we do not see it and the Lord wants us to see it in that way, isn't it? When we see it, then our lives become wholesome. Right? It's directed first toward God. Uh, and then there is indeed uh, a wholesome peace in our lives that God would uh, bless us with by acquainting them with the sanctuary, the holy things, the solemn services that were there performed. When they read the appoint the sort the their, they read the appointment of their Bibles, it would do them good to see the observance of in the tabernacle. It would make a deeper impression upon them, which would keep them out of the snares of the idolatrous customs. Right? Imagine you, you would you would have your feasting right, together with the study of God's word. Or you would have your feasting in an environment that you realize can compromise right, your faith in the Lord. Which one would be better? Right, would you choose, is it better to be able to gather together than to, to, to spend your resources in the, in the study of God's word and in the fellowship amongst the people of God? It would do them good to see the observance of the tabern of in the tabernacle. It would make a deeper impression upon them, which would keep them out of the snares of the idolatrous customs. It will have a good influence upon our const constancy in worship, never to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. And so, as you think about uh, what has happened in the last three years, Right, where uh, each time we wanted to gather right, is such a, a, a challenging occasion. But it did not deter us uh, from uh, gathering and we are thankful to God that we have not, uh, in that sense, been discouraged to gather uh, because of external restraints and constraints that are unbiblical, that are out of the will of God, that to usurp the authority of God in our lives. And our conscience uh, must indeed bear us through to reject uh, all incursions upon our worship of God. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as ye see the day approaching. Why those here refer to to neglect public worship is not specified. The commentator Albert Barnes observed, it may have been for such causes as the following. Some may have been deterred by the fear of persecution, as those who were thus assembled would be more disposed to danger than others. Some may have neglected the duty because they felt no interest in it, as professing Christians now sometimes do, it is possible that some may have had doubts about the necessity and propriety of their duty and on that account may have neglected it. Or it may perhaps have been, though we can hardly suppose that this reason existed, that some may have neglected it from a cause which now and sometimes operates from distracting dissatisfaction with a preacher or with some member or members of the church or with some measure in the church 
Whatever were the reasons, the Apostle says that they should not be allowed to operate, but that Christians should regard it as a sacred duty to meet together for the worship of God. None of the causes above suggested should deter men from this duty. With all who bear the Christian name, with all who expect to make advances in piety and religious knowledge, it should be regarded as a sacred duty to assemble together for public worship. And so, our faith is social, isn't it? Our graces are to be strengthened and invigorated by waiting together on the Lord. And it can be observed over the last three years, isn't it? When men and women and children do not assemble themselves together. Problems occur. And I was able to see and there were testimonies uh, of the certain places where even the police came and asked that the church be open because the crimes are increasing leaps and bounds. Ah, the restraining force of the Spirit of God when men gather before God in worship is not to be undermined or underestimated. There is an obvious propriety that men should assemble themselves for the worship of the Most High and no Christian can hope that this, His graces can grow or will grow or that He can perform His duty to His Maker without uniting thus with those who love the service of God. By the comfort of the communion of saints, we may be kept to our communion with God by using them to the most pleasant and delightful services of religion let them rejoice before the Lord that they may learn the fear of the Lord always the more pleasure we find in the ways of religion the more likely we shall be to persevere in those ways if we would isolate ourselves if we would feel ourselves lethargic and become discouraged, uh, that's where uh, many uh, problems come, isn't it? Depression, uh, young people going into depression, uh, taking depression pills, slashing themselves on the wrist, right? With, blades and pen knives, and these are very real, you know, there are people who came to us and show us, I, I did this, there, there's someone who did come to us and I was shown that kind of thing, see. So it's, it's quite a serious situation, isn't it? Verse, 17 to 20, 20, 20, verse 27 to 29, the given and the blessing. And the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. At the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and shalt lay it up within thy gates. And the Levites, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand which thou doest. One thing they must remember in their pious entertainments, to bid their Levites welcome to them. Thou shalt not forsake the Levites. Matthew Henry well observed, he says, let him never be a stranger to thy table, especially when thou eatest before the Lord. 
every third year, this tithe must be disposed of at home in the works of charity. Lay it up within thy gates and let it be given to the poor who, knowing the provision this law had made for them, no doubt, would come to seek it and that they might make the poor familiar to them and not disdain their company. They are here directed to welcome them to their houses. Hither let them come and eat and be satisfied. In this charitable distribution of the second tithe, they must have an eye to the poor ministers and add to their encouragement by entertaining them, then to poor strangers, not only for the supply of their necessities, but to put a respect upon them and so to invite them to turn proselytes and then to the fatherless and widow, who though perhaps they might have a competent maintenance left them, yet could not be supposed to live so plentifully and comfortably as they had done in months past. And therefore, they were to countenance them and help them to make them easy by inviting them to this entertainment. God has a particular care for widows and fatherless, he requires that we should have the same. It is his honour and will be ours to help the helpless. And if we thus serve God and do good with what we have, it is promised here that the Lord our God will bless us in all the work of our hand. The blessing of God is all in all to our outward prosperity and without that blessing, the work of our hands which we do will bring nothing to pass. The way to obtain that blessing is to be diligent and charitable. The blessing descends upon the working hand, except that God should bless thee in thy idleness and love of ease, but in all the work of thy hand. It is the hand of the diligent with the blessing of God upon it that maketh rich. He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand, but the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Proverbs 10 verse 4 and Proverbs 10 22. The blessing of the Lord, it maketh rich and he addeth no sorrow with it. And it descends upon the giving hand. He that thus scatters certainly increases and the liberal soul will be made fat. It is an undoubted truth, though little believed, that to be charitable to the poor and to be free and generous in the support of religion and any good work is the surest way of thriving. What is lent to the Lord will be repaid with abundant interest. Matthew Henry, Ezekiel 44 verse 30 And the first of all the first fruits of all things every and every oblation of all and of every sort of your oblations shall be the priest. Ye shall also give unto the priest the first of your dough, that he may cause the blessing to rest in thine house. The blessing of tithing is taught by Solomon. Proverbs 3, verse 9 to 10. Honor the Lord with thy substance, and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. There are those who love money and hoard money. There are those who squander money. Some use it selfishly, and some will kill for it. We will remember that Mark 10, verse 29 to 30, Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake and the gospels. But he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time. Houses, brethren, and sisters, and mothers, and children, and lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. Malachi 3 verse 10. Bring ye all the tithes into thy storehouse, into the storehouse, that they may there may be meat in my house, 
and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6 to 7. But I say, but this I say, he that soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, nor all of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Our Lord Jesus says, I showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. The blessing of giving has to be experienced. How can we understand this truth except through the exercise of faith in our giving? We are to support the weak, those who are unable to return our favour, those who are truly in need. We have to take God at His word to give and experience God's blessing. When we give, we lose what we have given. How can it be more blessed? We are to take Jesus at His word to obey and behold His glory in our lives, in our giving. And then there are certain areas of giving for Christian consideration. Right? Giving to God, giving to the Lord's work for the extension of His kingdom is to give wisely. By giving, we invest treasures in heaven. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. By far the wisest and most rewarding investments of all are those that are given for the furtherance of His work. The scripture are punctuated with commands, warnings, promises regarding the need to lay up treasures in heaven rather than on earth. 1 Timothy 6 verse 17 to 19 Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded nor trust in uncertain riches but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy that they do good that they be rich in good works ready to distribute, willing to communicate laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Giving to the Lord beyond the tithe will be prompted by Him and confirmed by your wife. The prompting will be completely consistently consistent with scriptural guideline. How to give? Jesus taught to give secretly. Matthew 6, verse 3 to 4. And when thou givest alms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doeth, that thy alms may be in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret, give himself shall reward thee openly. Giving to fatherless and widows, pure religion and undefiled before God, and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Giving to the poor, he that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that, and that which he giveth will he repay again. Bridges said well on this point, he says, The ordinance of God is that the poor shall never cease out of the land. Hence, the universal obligation is to have pity upon the poor. We must open our hearts as much as our hand. Deuteronomy 15 verse 7, which we shall look at it uh, the next time. If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of the gates in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thy heart, nor shut thy hand from thy poor brother. Verse 10. Thou shalt surely give him, and thy heart shall not be grieved when thou givest him, because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works and in all that thou puttest thy hand unto. 
giving to needy Christians, distributing to the necessity of saints. Romans 12, verse 13a, 1, Corinthians, 1 Timothy 6, verse 17 to 18, which we have uh, said, and Galatians 6, verse 10, as therefore we have op therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. The injunction to remember to do good for the needs of the saints with humbleness of heart. Look out for opportunity to bless a brother or sister in Christ with your giving. Giving to Christian workers. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honour, especially they who labour in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, the and the labourer is worthy of his reward. Those who labour in the Lord's vineyard, in, in the labour of his word. May the Lord strengthen his people to praise him, from which all blessings flow. Amen. May the Lord strengthen us with his word. Let us pray. Father, we thank thee for thy word. Strengthen us by thy grace, and comfort us, and grant to us thy joy and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. This I pray with thanksgiving through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.